Antifa, the fascist anti-fascist group that is actually fascist, is protesting a proposed new law that would force them to take off their masks while they're beating people up. It's a true story. The Unmask Antifa bill would mandate harsh jail sentences for anyone who, quote, injures, oppresses, threatens, or intimidates any person while wearing a mask, unquote. Fascist anti-fascist leader Adolf Fascist says the new law singles out Antifa unfairly just because they put on masks to injure, oppress, and intimidate people instead of, say, asking for candy on Halloween. The fascist anti-fascist Mr. Fascist said, quote, this bill makes no sense. How in the world am I supposed to injure, oppress, threaten, and intimidate people without wearing a mask? Everyone would be able to see my face and identify me, and then there would be consequences for terrorizing my fellow Americans. Is that really the sort of country we want to become? Unquote. Fascist anti-fascists like Mr. Fascist claim they are not fascists because they call themselves anti-fascists while assaulting innocent people in the streets like fascists. In a recent interview, the anti-fascist fascist Mr. Fascist said, quote, As an anti-fascist, I believe in freedom, and so I should be free to beat the living crap out of anyone who disagrees with me. Taking off my mask would hamper me in that important work. Plus, I might catch a glimpse of myself in a nearby storefront window and realize what a degraded monster I've become, which would be just plain depressing, unquote. The unmasked Antifa bill was proposed by three Republicans who brought the bill into Congress, where Democrats responded by putting on masks and beating them up. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. All right. Mona Charon uh, is a, a terrific syndicated columnist, political analyst, analyst, senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Institute and host of the Need to Know podcast, as well as a, uh, an author of two New York Times bestsellers, Useful Idiots, about how liberals got it wrong in the Cold War, and also Do-Gooders, about how liberals hurt those they claim to help. She's got a new book out. It is really good, very powerful, Sex Matters, How Modern Feminism Lost Touch with Science, Love, and Common Sense, Sex Matters by Mona Charon, one of my favorite people in the conservative movement. Here is our interview. Mona, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Drew. Great to see you. Your new book, Sex Matters by Mona Charon. I have to tell you, well, let, let's talk about it. You, you say that it has taken you, and in some ways you've been writing this book your whole life. What do you mean by that? Right, because I my life kind of matches the modern feminist movement. Uh, it, I was a Child, very small child when uh, Betty Friedan wrote her book, uh, The Feminine Mystique, and um, her um, acolytes over the years have uh, influenced my life because feminism has influenced us all. And, um, and I'm countercultural. I've never bought into the um, representation of reality that they were peddling. And what I point out in this book is that they're not just anti-men, but they, of course they are. They're, they're really um, against nature. That's their biggest that's their biggest battle is that they resent and hate what nature has done. Well, before we get to that, though, let me just say you have a wonderful family. You have a great career. Do, do you owe none of that to feminism? Would you have had that even without Betty Friedan? Right. So uh, that's a debatable thing. One of the things I talk about in Sex Matters is that women were moving into the workforce uh, before Betty Friedan wrote her book. And um, a lot of the changes that feminism has been able to claim credit for were probably under, were definitely underway before they even wrote a single word. And in any event, probably owed quite a bit to the changing nature of the economy toward an information economy and away from an industrial economy that plays in more to women's strengths. And there are other things going on in changes in the economy. But look, to be totally fair, I do give feminists some credit for doing some things that I agreed with. I think it was good that rape victims, for example, were no longer cross-examined on their sexual histories on the stand. You know, I think that there were other things where if women, if women had a little bit more self-confidence in the workplace, great, I'll give feminists credit for that. But in return, I just want them to be honest about the price that we have paid for their extremism, which has been dramatic. All right. Well, let's start then with where, where do they go wrong historically? Where do you feel that feminism, at least as we know it, because at some point women were arguing for the right to vote, things that we would probably right. all agree with. At what point right. do they go wrong? So they go wrong in the 1970s uh, when it became not just about equal pay for equal work and so on, but a real uh, comprehensive attack on nature herself, on uh, the differences between men and women, which they insisted were illusory 
And you're, I mean, we're all familiar with the expression that sex differences are completely socially constructed, right? Or culturally constructed. Well, that's just not true. And the, the um, no kidding, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's funny that it, it should be shocking to say that, but there yes, it is. Yeah. That's exactly. Yeah. And, and see the science caught up with them because they were peddling this stuff in the 1970s. And then uh, over the last number of decades, the science keeps rolling in. You know, we know so much more now about the role of hormones in brain development and about um, cross-cultural studies and about studies of infants. I talk in the book about how baby girl infants, a few days old, will respond more strongly to the sound of a human in distress than baby boys. And baby boys will stare longer at, a, um, at flashing lights and, and mechanical objects. And these things are, you know, could it be socially constructed when they're a few days old? <laughs> Doubt, doubtful. And then there's the other thing. When you look cross-culturally, you know, um, there are surveys that ask people, what are you looking for in a mate? And based on those answers, they can predict with 90% accuracy whether you're a male or a female. Wow. So men, men tend to be looking for youth and beauty in women, and women tend to be looking for resources in men. And this is true from Bangladesh to Boston to Beijing. So it's probably not culture. There must be something to it. <laughs> it's funny that the people who accuse us of being unscientific and who believe in evolution and get so upset when anybody denies evolution, deny the effects of evolution. You know, well, exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. And so, yeah, they are the anti-science party when it comes to sex differences, for sure. So let's let's talk about the effects of this, uh, especially I mean, the book is called Sex Matters. So especially in, in regards to sex and the way people deal with sex, what has been the effect on, on women as far as you're concerned? What is what has feminism done to women? Well, first of all, it has denied them the traditional protections that um, were a part of our social inheritance. Right. Right. Um, the, the idea that we were that we were vouchsafed was that women are the more sensitive, vulnerable sex, and that men were had to be raised to be gentlemen, to be protective toward women and respectful of their modesty. And the sexual revolution that the feminists endorsed swept that all away. And the other thing the feminists did was that they denigrated chivalry. And they said, you know, don't hold that door for me and don't, you know, don't do any of that. It's it's patronizing. It's, you know, and but of course, when you sacrifice that kind of male chivalry, you leave women with very, um, very more vulnerable, let's say. And I think when you look at the Me Too movement, it's being sold by some as yes, yet another phase of feminism. But I think of it actually as a reaction against feminism mm -hmm. and against the sexual revolution. It's, it's women saying we're tired of being treated this way. We do want gentlemanly behavior from men. And uh, so in that sense, it's a it's kind of a rebellion. But can you ask for gentlemanly behavior from men without being a lady? No, <laughs> and, no. And that and look, I mean, the other the other aspect of why I am so um, why, I, why I want to bring feminists to account is that um, they always claim to be pro woman. But the fact is, when you take a look at a woman's life in full, we cannot have full and happy, most of us cannot have full, happy and fulfilled lives if we're separated from men, if we're alienated from men. I mean, our happiness depends on one another and we're complementary. And so for women to be expected to have the best possible lives, they need husbands, they need sons and brothers and all the people that are closest to them. And, um, Unfortunately, because of feminism, which was all about smashing the patriarchy and uh, dismantling marriage and the family, um, women are um, without that support that the family provides. Now, so are men, and that's really bad for men too. But, uh, but the feminists were wrong in seeing marriage as the trap for women that had been carefully pl plotted by men. Now, is there is there a possibility? It seems to me one of the things that I, I really oppose feminism. I'm really against feminism, and I, one of the things I hate about it is that it seems to me to be against femininity, which seems to be one of the graces of life. I mean, it seems to be one of the consolations of life that there are men and there are women. Uh, that you know, that, I thought that was the good part. You know, after yeah. all, all, all the difficult stuff, is it is it possible though in in 
chasing women out of the home and telling them that motherhood is not a necessary function, that, that maybe the answer to that is that women need to construct their lives differently in terms of time, that maybe their youth can be spent one way, that while men spend their youths trying to build a career, maybe women should build the career later. Is that, is that offensive? Is that too much to ask? So, so here's the, the reality that you don't hear very much, which is upper class women, that is the upper third, right? Women who have college degrees are doing that. Yeah, They are living out the most traditional choices. The ones who are highly educated and have options because they tend to be the ones who are married. Um, 76% of married mothers say that their ideal situation when their children are young is either working part time or having no work outside the home. Yeah. It's the it's the people who are less educated. It's the people at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale who are faced with an awful choice because marriage is 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 rapidly disappearing, and so women are you know forced to work. And what do they do? They they don't have a career. They just have a job, and you know they can't be with their kids. So the kids get farmed out to so a high school graduate, let's say, who is raising kids by herself is farming them out to low cost daycare to be raised by or, or cared for during the days anyway, by an even less educated woman uh, who's, who's gonna be doing that job. It makes no sense. And it's one of the tragedies of our era is that women are being driven away from their children and, and caring for children is one of the great pleasures and joys of life. And the feminists happen to have missed that too. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I want to I want to get back to the idea of, of sex. Uh, what would you tell a young woman about her sex life? I mean, obviously, one of the things that they're arguing, which sounds fair, is that women should be as free in their sexuality as men are. They should behave essentially as men have behaved. And yet that seems to lead to a lot of depression and confusion. What would you tell a young woman about her sex life? And, and self-harm? Yeah, the um, the feminist message. I can tell you that when I got to college, the the theme was "chaste makes waste." That was one of the uh, wow. Wow. slogans. And yep, yeah. yep. Yeah, yeah. And we were instructed that, that to be really great women meant to be as promiscuous as men. And uh, I would tell a young woman that they've been told a lie. They have been told that men and women are exactly the same when it comes to sexuality, and that is a lie. Women are more um, monogamous. They are less into casual sex. They want relationships. They want love. Um, there's an old saw. It's a little, it's way oversimplified, but there's truth in it anyway. It's in my book. Um, men give love to get sex and women give sex to get love. Mm. <laughs> and <laughs> there's a little bit of truth to that. And mm. women should be aware that no matter what the feminists tell them, they will always be the more vulnerable sex. Uh, that they will not be able to engage in casual sex with the same uh, abandon that men do and walk away without feeling hurt or wounded in some way. Some can, but a very, but but not many. It, the typical thing for a woman is that when she has sex with a man, she gets attached. Mm. And uh, that's just biology. And so she should be very careful in discriminating about who she has sex with and when and where. What what about abortion? I mean, one of the arguments for abortion is this is what gives women the freedom to have the sex they want. Uh, this is what gives them, you know, makes them equal to men. And if you take abortion away from them, you've taken away their rights. Yeah, isn't that great? So um, <laughs> they've yeah. they've they've persuaded generations of people that you know here, look, you should be sexually promiscuous. Uh, which, hey, is a great benefit to men, um, but they claim that it was for women's sake. You can be sexually promiscuous, and then when you get pregnant, we're going to allow you to have this surgical procedure that will rip your heart out as well as your baby. Yeah. And isn't that a great advance for women? Um, so look, and besides which, um, abortion is, um, is an atrocity. And uh, so even if, even if it were true, which it is not, um, that women regard it very casually and, uh, and, and need it as a, as a backup for failed birth control and in order to have sex. No, it's uh, even still, even if people did feel that way, I'd still oppose it because it's morally, uh, it's, it's morally wrong. So, so here, here you are, someone with a family, with a career. I mean, you are one of the most important conservative uh, voices and columnists. 
what what reaction do you get when you say these things from feminists? I mean, I've no, I, I haven't, I can't help but notice the feminists can be kind of fierce and ferocious whenever anybody opposes them. Uh, one thinks of the harpies. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what kind of reactions do you get uh, when you make these comments? So it depends. You know, there there are um, pieces that I've written where I've talked about um, the Me Too movement in sympathetic ways. And they said, oh, well, you know, like she has a point there, you know, and, and uh, it is it is true what she says about casual sex and about women uh, being more vulnerable. So sometimes they're open to that. When it comes to abortion, they tend to get their backs up. And um, certainly when I talk about making it easier for women to spend time with their kids and not driving them out of their uh, homes if they don't want to be driven and most don't. Um, they they re- react badly to that too, and you know it's they they've been using the same slogans for centuries. It feels like you know oh you want to have women you know barefoot and pregnant and slaves in the kitchen and the bedroom and so on and so forth. So you you get some of that. <laughs> I, I, can't, I I'm going to watch and see if you get reviewed in the uh, New York Times, which uh, I can't. But pro- they'll probably try to ignore you. I think that's probably their, their best bet. <laughs> what do you yep. what do you want to see going forward? I, you know it seems that feminism has so permeated. Certainly, one of the things that's unfair is that so many of the people who are on the news and on television are uh, women who have left their children at home and so are very sympathetic to that point of view. Right. And, the, and the feminist who, uh, the woman who stays at home with her children doesn't have the same kind of voice, doesn't have the same uh, megaphone that they have. What, do, what would you like to see going forward? And what, what do you think will happen going forward? Well, that was one of the reasons I wanted to write the book is because I have had a career and I wanted to say, look, I was happy with my choice. You know, I cut back on my career when my kids were young um, and I have no regrets. I mean, I could have been I could have been a contender. <laughs> contender right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I'm happier. My kids are happier. My husband's happier. We're all happier that I made the decisions that I made. And so that was one of my goals was to be able to just be a woman's voice who could say that. Um, and another goal is to cause people to back up and look at the true radicalism of what the feminists have argued over the last several decades and um, confront the fact that it has led to a great deal of misery to many, many women struggling to raise kids on their own. Uh, to many men being disconnected from their families and addicted and alone, not working. Um, all of these things are in part a react, a uh, consequence of the feminist message. And so I hope to spark a debate um, and get people to reconsider some of the pieties that feminism has fed them, as well as some of the misrepresentations of reality, like the 77 cents on the dollar statistic, which is bogus, um, and other things, uh, like there are no differences between the sexes. And so, you know, my, my hope is to, is to cause a reevaluation. Mona Charon, not just a contender, but a champ in my book. Uh, <laughs> sex, sex matters. Only you and I know what that's from now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sex matters. Mona, thanks so much for coming on. I hope you'll come back and we'll talk again. And if you're in town, let Great. me know. Okay, thanks, Jim. Good to see you. Bye. This is the Clavin Show. Hunkity dunkity. This is the Clavin Show. Tickety boo. This is the Clavin Show. Birds they be singing, yo. Also be winging, yo. No ease in Clavin, though. This is the Clavin Show. Tickety boo. Hunkity dunkity. Tickety boo. <laughs> that was from Brett Siegel. I would know it is not going to replace our fantastic theme song. But somebody on Twitter criticized my theme song yesterday and said, said they said I laughed too much and they didn't like my theme song. I thought, man, you are just wound too tight. And at the same time, Brett sent that in. So I thought I would just use it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to send us off into the Clavenless Weekend. Make it, it makes the Clavenless Weekend a little more tolerable that you don't have to listen to that again. 
I, I have no idea who this guy is, but they wanted to, no, no. <laughs> I'm actually, I am actually a really interesting fan of Matt's because I don't always agree with him. Uh, in fact, sometimes I am very uh, powerfully disagree with him, but I always, always admire him. He's known through his writing, podcasts, and speeches as a fierce and articulate defender of truth, moral values, religious liberty, and the Christian faith. You can find him here on The Daily Wire, and his podcast is also on Daily Wire's YouTube channel, Facebook page, and iTunes, and follow him on Twitter at Matt Walsh Blog. Matt, W-A-L-S-H, blog. Matt, how you doing? Good, Drew. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a Good pleasure. Here. I'm, I'm really glad to talk to you, and uh, congratulations on your globe. It makes you look very intelligent. Uh, thank you. In fact, I forgot. I wanted to, I don't know if you can see oh, that. Is. Yes. Put it right there. Yes, you look there more go. intelligent even as you, uh, even just lifting that up made you look much more intelligent. I, so, I thank you. So I have to tell you, I, I, I read your stuff all the time, and I find your, your point of view incredibly bracing because I'm a... a, a a much more uh, lax in my devotion to uh, to some Christian doctrine than you are, and I have to hold myself up to your opinions and see sometimes if I agree with you. Uh, here, here's the last thing I want to ask you about, and this uh, this will really get you. I've, I've been having a problem. I'm an Episcopalian, which is Catholic light, and I'm an Episcopalian for a very specific reason, but recently they've gotten so far left and crazy that I've talked about the fact that I really think I may have to leave the church, and a lot of people wrote to me saying I should become a Catholic. A lot of people wrote to me saying I should become a Mormon as well. Those were the two I got most from. Yeah. My my problem with Catholicism, I'm going to put it in front of you and see what your response to this, is I feel that in the last analysis, my prayerful uh, uh, reading of Scripture, along with being informed by great theology, I'm a big uh, Pope Benedict XVI uh, fan, so I read his theology and I compare what I'm thinking. But ultimately, my conscience has to rule over the authority of the church. Why is that wrong? Um, I think that uh, we, you know, you do have to follow your your conscience in the end, and that if you're, you know, the the distinction here is that there are things that are objectively wrong. I guess you would agree, right? That there are things that are objectively wrong yeah. and objectively right. And you could do now, theoretically, um, if you really feel your conscience is calling you to do a certain thing, and it turns out that that thing is objectively wrong in the end, my belief, and also the Catholic belief, if you like, is that you did an objectively wrong thing, but your moral guilt would be severely mitigated in the eyes of God because you really thought that you were following your conscience. So that's, I guess that's kind of the, the interplay between the authority of not just the church, but scripture and your own conscience. Because when you talk about, well, you got to follow your conscience, um, well, there's also, you know, you got to follow your conscience as opposed to the church. Well, then there's also scripture as well. So, you know, what if scripture tells you do X, Y, Z, but you really feel your conscience taking you another direction? So you're going to run into that, even without the church, you're still, you could still theoretically run into that, um, run into that, into that confusion. Uh, so we, Go ahead, sorry. Well, does it, is that something that, if that happened to you, if you said, you know, I've really prayed on this, I've thought about it, I've read Scripture, I've li and I disagree with the Church on this important issue, what would you do then? I would recognize, I mean, ideally, you know, if I'm doing the right thing, I would recognize that my own understanding is flawed. I'm, I'm a limited person. I have, and I have my own biases, my own temptations, and I would recognize that it's flawed and I have to conform myself with this higher truth. The same as if I read something in, in scripture, if I read, Jesus said a lot of very challenging things and I might read some of those things and say, wow, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. I, I mean, it just doesn't make total sense to me. But I also realize that I have to humble myself to this authority and follow it, even if it doesn't make sense to me. And that I would submit in the end is what faith is all about. It's about, you know, walking forward to the to the light, even when you don't quite understand everything around you, and that's 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 what it means to be a Christian, I think. Matt Walsh, the host of the Matt Walsh Show here on the Daily Wire, it is great to talk to you. I love listening to you, I love reading your stuff, and uh, I hope you come back. We'll talk again. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Matt. Thanks. Trigger warning: I'm Andrew Claven, and this is the Andrew Claven Show. Clavin Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Vietnam poisoned uh, liberalism's view of America.
and American exceptionalism, American goodness, mm -hmm. the benignity of America, basically coming out, if you like, of the Second World War uh, and all the good that we had done in the world. So that was sort of a turning against America as a moral exemplar. And I do think they felt that we had lost the mandate of heaven. Let's talk a little bit about American foreign policy. Uh, you haven't uh, changed much on the foreign policy front, at least not as much as you've changed your views on domestic policy, as you your, yourself admit uh, in your book. W what happened to liberal foreign policy? What happened to liberal anti-communism and the party of Scoop Jackson and so forth? Well, I know they sort of sailed away. They gave up on the... I mean, they're used... People don't know this, but don't remember... Uh, but in the mid, by the mid-70s, there was still a very significant part of the Democratic Party that was rather conservative on foreign policy. It went by various names, Coalition for a Democratic Majority. People like, as you say, Scoop Jackson, uh, Paul Nitze, mm -hmm. Pat Moynihan. Uh, they were, you know, unblinking social democratic great society, liberals and domestic, but they had no illusions about evil. Uh, that they have disappeared. The Democratic Party, one by one, either they decided to abandon that, mm -hmm. they left the, the last of the Mohicans, really, is Joe Lieberman, and the fact that he's had to leave the party was pushed out as sort of a symbol of how... The, the, the Democrats gave up on the Cold War. They love to say, oh, the Cold War was a time when we all agreed. <laughs> Everything was so simple. Clinton right. used to say that all agreed. I was in every one of the fights in the 80s. Yeah. They fought tooth and nail against every Reagan policy and they were wrong on every single one, starting with the freeze, starting with the build-up, starting with strategic defenses, starting with what I call the Reagan Doctrine, which is supporting anti-communist guerrillas, starting everywhere. And they, they walk around saying, oh no, it was so easy and we got it right. They got it wrong. They were unwilling to recognize evil and to do something about facing it down. And that's the same problem that we have today. A Barack Obama who won't even say the words radical Islam, who won't identify the enemy, and who thinks, for example, as we speak today, uh, that he can make a detente, uh, some kind of philosophical arrangement, and joint hegemonic uh, presence in the Middle East with Iran. People where the leader chants death to America and where they're building intercontinental ballistic missiles, which I can assure you, you don't need if you're an Iranian to hit Tel Aviv. That's not intercontinental distance. And that's a short-term rocket. ICBMs are hitting other continents, meaning hitting us. And that's the same philosophical strain that uh, I'm afraid has afflicted the Democrats since the Vietnam War, when that part of the party, the John Kennedy part, the Hubert Humphrey part, uh, the Harry Truman part, which was we will bear any burden, and that was less important than the end of that sentence, this is Kennedy's inaugural address, uh, to secure the survival of liberty. And that was their credo, and they gave it up after Vietnam. Was it, was it just Vietnam that, the, the, that anti-communist uh, sentiment in the party um, you know, hit the shoals of on, or was there something else going on um, that, uh, that with Vietnam, or that took advantage of Vietnam to move the party away from its historic uh, I think situation? That's a very good point. Vietnam was sort of the central issue and the symbol and the embodiment, but it was a larger issue. Vietnam poisoned uh, liberalism's view of America and American exceptionalism, American goodness, mm -hmm. the benignity of America, basically coming out, if you like, of the Second World War uh, and all the good that we had done in the world. So that was sort of a turning against America as a moral exemplar. And I do think they felt that we had lost the mandate of heaven. Mm -hmm. We had lost the moral authority to be the hegemonic nation that we were and largely still are. 
uh, and therefore or to put down the mantle. It was a kind of a disgust with that position and that we were doing more harm than good, Vietnam being the example. So it was a turning against the culture. That's why it was called the counterculture, turning against Americanism. And where did that come from? Is that from the campuses? May we blame them, or is it something no. else? I don't know that it, the campuses have that much influence. The campuses sort of captured the feeling. Certainly the adults who should have known the better acquiesced to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if they felt it, but uh, I would put it in a slightly other way. It was generational. Mm -hmm. That generation, which were the children of the greatest generation, sort of... Uh, it was a revolt against their parents, what was seen as the bland 50s, what was seen as the stasis, and what was seen as kind of a smug satisfaction. Uh, and, you know, the idea of the greatest generation as an invention of the 80s and the 90s of the Reagan era surely wasn't around the 60s and 70s. Uh, so whether the actual student culture created it, I don't know. It was a large part of it, but certainly the adults collaborated. The Democratic Party was run by adults, not children, and they nominated McGovern. It wasn't a student council election, it was a presidential election. <laughs> Now, this is what I deal with on a more daily basis. That we're, and we were just talking about this case. Is anybody familiar with this book? Well, obviously it's called Notre Dame versus the Klan. It's about the defeat of the Klan when they marched on Notre Dame in 1924. Sometimes people forget that the Klan was pretty sort of equal opportunity in its contempt for different pe people. And they also hated Catholics. So the Klan tried to mark, march on Notre Dame in 1924, and this book celebrates the fact that Notre Dame students got together and defeated them in a street fight. It celebrates that. Now, the fact that it's an anti-racist book doesn't make it any more or less protected. It just makes what happens next that much more ironic. <laughs> because a, an employee at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, saw this book saw the, uh, saw the uh, rally on the cover. And by the way, that's, that's an actual picture of the rally when they marched on Notre Dame <laughs> um, and the burning crosses. The employee was offended. They did not bother talking to the student who was reading the book. By the way, this book is available at the IUPUI uh, student library. Um, that's, uh, uh, he was found guilty of racial harassment without a hearing. And as bad as that is, and obviously, if you look at papers and look at the law, this is obviously protected speech. You can read offensive books on campus. Actually, you're kind of supposed to uh, <laughs> read, uh, read challenging books on campus. Um, but as bad as this case is, and the fact that it took the, the combined effort of FIRE, the ACLU, and the Wall Street Journal to get this university to back down, that's terrible. This is, again, this is not a close call in terms of the law. But what's worse about it and what scares me more than anything else is that when he went to go talk to professors about whether or not he should stand up for his rights and his clearly established First Amendment rights, they said, don't bother. What scares me is that students did not come to this student's defense. A previous generation of students hearing that someone was uh, found guilty of reading a book in public would have literally rioted. And this bleeds out in really peculiar ways. Now, I think the standard argument that people want to hear about what, what's happened to our campuses, depending on you know, you know, your political point of view, is sometimes people just want the, it's just political correctness run amok. It's just groupthink. It's just too many people who agree with each other wanting to enforce their point of view. That's not all that's happening. A big chunk of what's going on on campuses is the, uh, the unleashing of hordes of administrators. The exp uh, and this is, uh, to put this in perspective, uh, within your own lifetimes, the number in 2005, the uh, hopefully none of you are younger than nine, <laughs> within your own lifetime, the number of administrators on college campuses, of full-time administrators, outstripped the number of full-time professors as of 2005, and that's on average for schools all over the country. And that trend line has you know, only gotten worse over the years. Uh, universities are increasingly administration heavy, and, and what do they do? 
they regulate practically everything. And that's how you end up with codes like this. This is University of Cincinnati, um, and they were telling students for, uh, by the time we got involved for years, we first brought this to their attention back, way back in 2007, that they had what they called a free speech zone on campus. Um, it was 0.1% of campus. It was actually, it's that little end of the point on the push pin. The, the green push pin itself is actually about 20 times bigger than the actual free speech zone. And not only did they limit free speech and protests and handing out newspapers on campus to that tiny little area, you had to get 10 days advance permission to even use that little tiny area. So we're, we're being nice. We're telling the university for years that this is unconstitutional and we're getting contemptuous letters back saying, nah, -uh, no, it's not, which is of course laughable because it, it, it so clearly is. So we worked with some students and they uh, tried to get a ballot initiative signed on campus. Um, a ballot initiative that had to be signed within a couple days, so they wanted to get it signed. They didn't want to be limited to the ridiculous, dinky little free speech zone. They knew they didn't have to be. And they asked, and they told, they, they put the university on notice about this. They said, listen, we're going to petition our government for redress of grievances. Um, we want to do this as free people. Uh, what do you say about that? Their response was that if, they, if these students were seen walking around campus, they would be arrested for trespass. Now, as bad as this case is, again, what horrifies me about it more than this happening, and this, this pisses me off plenty, don't get me wrong, is the fact that a state lawyer, that the University General Counsel thought it was a good idea that when the university got sued for this, that it was good to defend this code in court. I don't understand what the motivation is for a federally paid lawyer to demand that 99.9% .9 of public campuses be non-free speech zones. But, and these things are not uncommon. Um, we, the, oh, oh, and by the way, when this was, when, when this got in front of a judge, he, you know, he did a spit take, basically. This got defeated as, uh, as soon as it got in front, of, in front of a court, and we'd been telling them that for years. So this, again, not a close call. And I wanna point out that this stuff is happening today. This is happening right now. Um, Modesto Junior College, anybody familiar with this case? Modesto Junior College in Modesto, California, um, a student thought his administration was so heavy-handed, was so out of control, that he basically bet himself that he couldn't even hand out copies of the Constitution on Constitution Day, which is September 17th. And not 10 minutes before he went out to try to hand out copies of the Constitution, on campus to celebrate Con uh, Constitution Day. In the open part of campus, in the open part of the quad, a police officer, co a, a campus police officer, not, 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 a, not a real police officer, um, comes up to him and says that he can't, that he has to be a registered student group, that he has to go to the tiny little free speech zone, that he needs advanced state permission in order to hand out constitutions on Constitution Day. So he's a nice kid, so he goes and talks to a, uh, a member of the clerical staff um, seen there, and she immediately starts going through um, this huge folder to figure out if, he, if he's allowed to and when he can use the tiny little free speech zone on campus. Turns out he can't hand out constitutions on Constitution Day because it's already booked, um, but he can maybe in a couple days, and if he's not available during that narrow time frame, he could probably hand them out sometime in October. <laughs> And again, this school was willing to go to court to defend their right to so badly misinterpret the First Amendment. Something's gone very wrong here. And just to really bring the point home, it's not like they're winning these cases. This is just a selection of the cases uh, universities have lost over the years defending campus speech codes. And speech zones are a kind of speech code. Uh, ridiculous on uh, overbroad uh, uh, restrictions on freedom of speech uh, that, that, have been, uh, that, that have come into vogue since the 1980s, every single time they are challenged, they are defeated. They were defeated first at University of Michigan. They were, uh, I'm going to talk about when they were defeated at University of Connecticut. They were defeated at my alma mater, Stanford uh, Law School. Even though it's a private school, there was a state law that actually imposed First Amendment standards on uh, Stanford and other non-sectarian schools in California. And, and just again and again, every single time these are challenged, they are defeated. Yet nonetheless, they remain on campus. And they remain the rule, not the exception. We have a full-time lawyer 
on staff who evaluates the codes for, at this point, around 430 colleges around the country. Um, she's incredibly meticulous. Um, I, I, I can't think of anybody I'd trust more to do this. And this is what she found in our most recent study, that 58.6% of universities we evaluate maintain what we call red light speech codes. Um, that is codes that would be, you know, to put it simply, are laughably unconstitutional. Now, interestingly, now I usually wait for this to come up in questions, but just to review it really quickly, private versus public colleges. Private colleges are bound by the First Amendment. Um, they, uh, they're not allowed to have speech codes. Uh, private colleges are not bound by the First Amendment. They do not have to guarantee free speech rights, but FIRE's position when it comes to private schools is if you do promise free speech rights, which Williams does, the overwhelming majority of, of liberal arts colleges do, you should deliver and you should get at least as much free speech at those colleges that you've been told you will get it as you do it at, at, a, at, at a public college. But what's interesting about this number, this 58.6, is even though the legal obligations of public and private schools are very different, it's around the same number for public and private schools. It's around, I think it's maybe 57% of, of private schools um, have, have red light speech codes. And okay, so you saw how many times these codes have been defe defeated. Um, you've seen uh, you know, how much uh, bad press they can generate for, for universities. Uh, and the fact that it's 58.6 it's is an absolute scandal. But keep in mind that that's an improvement. When we first started doing the, the, the survey, it was 75% of universities re, re, uh, retained red light speech codes. And there's been lawsuit after lawsuit after, um, you know, we, we have something called the speech code of the month program at FIRE. And that can be very embarrassing because universities have codes like this. I, I picked this one just because it's just so, so raw. <laughs> no student shall offend anyone on university or operated property. Now, it's just so pure. It's just saying you, you have a right not to be offended. If you offend somebody, you're guilty. And what scares me is I feel like uh, you, uh, more than a generation of students have grown up with such ridiculous codes in K through 12 that they look at this and they go, oh, that doesn't sound that bad. And then I have to remind them, every single one of you have violated this code. You do not want to leave it up to administrators to, uh, uh, to assumedly have you all guilty and then just leave it up to their good graces to not find you guilty. You, that, it, that is misplaced trust. That's not the way power dynamics should work. And again, these kind of codes laughed out of court. You cannot say that you uh, can't offend anybody. That is considered both vague and overbroad. That will not stand a second in, in a court of law. But this one's my favorite one because it says so many different things about, uh, about speech codes. So way back in the heyday, the early heyday of speech codes, say like circa 1990, uh, University of Connecticut passes a speech code that includes a ban on derogatory names, inconsiderate jokes, and inappropriately directed laughter vague, broad, every single one of you have violated this code at some point or another, at least as far as power is concerned. And this was defeated in a, at University of Connecticut in a court of law in 1991. It, this was, it was also laughed at in the local newspapers. It was laughed at nationally, maybe it was inappropriately directed as far as they were concerned. <laughs> but it was defeated, and, and ignominiously so. But nonetheless, it was resuscitated in its full text by Drexel University nine years later. And, and we only defeated it in 2006. So the only way this university could have found out about this code, to my knowledge, would be reading about this ridiculous code that got defe uh, defeated at University of Connecticut and then saying to themselves, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Let's pass that at Drexel. So we had to defeat this, uh, defeat this code again. Watch, watch where you laugh. <laughs> 